The Tom Woods Show, episode 1792. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you are surrounded by irrational, panicked people who think you're a terrible person because you don't want to lock everybody in their houses. No amount of reasoning appears to accomplish anything. And not to mention the media has done nothing but stoke fear and fail to provide context. Well, one of the many benefits you get as a supporter of The Tom Woods Show is membership inside The Tom Woods Show Elite. Recently migrated off Facebook, so if that was holding you back, no longer. This group will keep you sane and informed, and as an added bonus, it won't accuse you of wanting to kill your grandmother. Join me in there at supportinglisteners.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. You're in for a real treat today. I couldn't be happier to be joined today by Jay Bhattacharya, professor of medicine at Stanford University. He's an MD and PhD. He's been working both on the epidemiology of COVID-19 as well as the appropriate policy response. And he's one of the three authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, which we've talked about numerous times on this program, and no doubt we'll talk about it today, which has to do with dealing with COVID-19 without lockdowns, taking a less sledgehammer approach. So we'll definitely have an opportunity to talk about that. But he has been absolutely heroic throughout this whole thing for months and months. He's been in the media spotlight, which is not somewhere as an academic he's accustomed to being, but he has stepped up right up and taken on a role that I'm sure he never anticipated for himself, but he really is one of the key spokesmen for sanity right now. So to be able to talk to him is a real privilege and a delight. So Professor Bhattacharya, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Before we get into it, I have to tell you something that I really admire about you, and it's something that I just can never do, maybe in certain limited settings, but I've watched you speak so many times to sympathetic folks and to unsympathetic folks alike, and you maintain such a scholarly temperament and your poise, your balance, your everything about your presentation is so professional. I, on the other hand, am such a hothead. You know, I, I'm, I'm, and I think there's room for both because I probably reach some people who need to be grabbed by the collar, but I'm not for everybody. And you, the way, like, for example, I saw you debate, and I can't remember his name now, and and it was cordial, if a bit chilly. But then at one point, he said something about your position that would have sent me into a tirade, and you simply said, that's not fair. And I thought, that's my Jay Bhattacharya right there. So thank you for that. I, uh, I, I have lost my temper once in this, uh, in one of the public things. I won't, I won't say what it was, but I, I, I regretted it. My temperament is just, it just comes natural to me. I can't, I can't help it. I wish I had some of your fire. Now, honestly, we need you to be who you are. Honest to goodness, you, you've just been tremendous. I have a bunch of things I want to ask that really are areas where I sort of feel weak. First of all, I don't belong, you, you were telling me before we started recording that this is not your life typically where you're constantly in demand for media appearances and people either love or hate you and all. This is, you, you, you normally live the quiet life of an academic. Well, likewise, I'm a historian with a Columbia PhD. I don't normally talk about viruses. What the heck do I know about this? But what I do know, you know, what I can do is, is read the news about what the consequences have been of the government responses. And I'm and certainly entitled to an opinion on that. So I've been talking a lot about it. But there are some areas where I feel weak or I feel like I wish I had a better answer or I understood things better. And, and not even so much that I want to win debates. I genuinely want to understand things better. So, for example, let me start with this. We've been saying, people like you and and me and others have been saying that lockdowns have terrible public health consequences, that you can't just look at one virus. You have to look at all kinds of factors that are at work when you engage in something as drastic as lockdown. But what what you tend to get these days as a response is, it could be that some places bungled lockdowns, but when we look at the example of Australia, yes, sure, it was, it's been pretty brutal and every five minutes they have to shut down again, but they come out of it with zero cases. And Taiwan has had good results. China had a brutal lockdown, but they seem to be okay. Doesn't that go to show that it's too sweeping to say that just lockdowns flat out don't work? Yeah, I mean, it it is too sweeping, right? So if you have a a relatively few cases in your island, you can close the borders, lock down sharply, you know, kill your economy for a little while, and then then, uh, you, you can get to zero, potentially. Right? We saw that in New Zealand, although they had a little flare up in the summer, right, which scared the heck out of them. Uh, we saw that in Australia 
and there they had this massive draconian thing in Victoria. And they, when, of course, China, uh, they didn't have a very few cases, but they did this military-style lockdown, cordon sanitaire, uh, I mean, just a huge thing that's just not exportable to any place that has a democratic government. I think, so it is possible in principle, like you think about lockdowns as, you know, you have a bunch of mice that usually interact with each other. You put them in cages separate from one another, separated by six feet, maybe you put masks on their faces. And then, you know, the code will stop, you know, whatever disease you want to stop spreading between them, the spread by respiratory you know, uh, means by mice will stop. But humans aren't like that, especially humans that respect human rights. And it's especially impossible in the context where the disease is already very widespread. This disease is not ever going away. It's never going to go to zero. We just have to come to terms with that. And once you do, then, then all of the rest follows. When I say lockdowns are impossible, I, what I mean is where we are now, it is not feasible to use lockdowns to get to, to zero COVID. What about people who say, I, I hear what you're saying and I know there have been terrible consequences, but now that we have these vaccines on the horizon, the lockdowns are, as at least one governor put it, a bridge to the vaccine. Like surely, I, I get that if we say you have to be in your house indefinitely, that's not manageable. But if we say, could you tough it out for another four to five months? That doesn't seem absolutely not doable. Yeah, I mean, let's think about that, right? So like if you, the, the question again, is not, it's not, it's a human lockdown. The premise of that is that there's no cost to the lockdown. And in fact, that we're in some sense, all equally vulnerable to disease and all equally affected by the lockdown. Like both of those are false. Uh, so first, who actually bears the burden of the lockdown? Well, it's, it's, it's actually people who are deemed essential. You have a 64-year-old uh, diabetic Costco clerk, and they're being asked to make a, a tough decision between do I expose myself to the virus, which has a re relatively high mortality rate for someone who's 64 and, and has diabetes, versus someone like me, I'm 52, I, I mean, I'm relatively privileged. I get to sit on Zoom meetings all day long, uh, and uh, I, I can order on Amazon, I, I can order out. I, I, the lockdown protects the rich and ask the relatively poor to be exposed to the virus, right? So that's the actuality of the lockdown. It's not just, let's stay safe. It's like continuing to expose the poor. And I, let's talk about schools, right? The lockdown of the United States means closed schools. Well, who's affected by that? I mean, my, my kids are harmed by that. Like my, they've, they've stolen a year of my kids' life. Uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of sources of joy that they would otherwise have had is go are gone. But for poor kids, it's even more devastating. I mean, they don't have a, somebody who can help them with their math. They don't have somebody who, who's watching over them at, you know, at home to make sure they're doing their work. They have internet. But poor kids don't have those kind of advantages. It's a huge engine for inequality. Four more months of that engine? I mean, I think that, that so the lockdown costs are, are, should be at the very forefront of our minds whenever we think about lockdowns. And so talk about them as if they're just a bridge, an easy, costless bridge to, the, to a, a happy future is, is a mistake. Uh, especially because there's a different plan, hopefully we can talk about later, that you can replace it with, that would do much better. On the other side about the harms from COVID, well, I mean, the harms from COVID are very unevenly distributed. If you're over 70, the survival rate is something like 95%. If you're under 70, it's something like 99.95%. Well, I mean, that means that the lockdown is going to harm, on net, harm people that are, are young. Because there's no benefit for them for it, just on net, it's harm. It may protect older people. I, I actually have some doubts about that as well, but it, that's that's at its best case. So you end up with like saying, okay, let's let's harm young people or younger or non vulnerable people for four more months. So when I hear that, that's what I hear until we get the vaccine. I mean, no, that's that's a mistake. There's an alternate policy that we could do better with. Well, I certainly want to talk about the Great Barrington Declaration in a minute. There's another example that I want to run by you, and that's the very, very interesting case of Japan. Now, early on, you can go back and see the headlines in the Washington Post and in Science and other mainstream periodicals warning that Japan had botched its coronavirus response. Uh, the Washington Post said, too little, too late with Japan, because they had maybe a half-hearted lockdown, some public health recommendations, uh, they wore masks, I suppose, but they didn't do the mass testing that they were supposed to do. They did much, much less testing than, say, South Korea did, which is also held up as an example. And so then later on, Japan, by the very same people who had been screaming, screaming for weeks that Tokyo was going to be overwhelmed, these very same people said, oh, Japan succeeded because they, you know, they did what I want. 
Did they? Really? You're the people who were screaming they were going to all be dead? And so now it's that they wore masks and they did contact tracing. Now, the interesting thing about the Japan contact tracing, let me just read you one sentence I read in the Japan Times, that they did it much more surgically than is being recommended in the West. So I read this in the Japan Times. Encouraging people with mild or no symptoms to take PCR tests would have revealed nothing but resulted in isolating false positive cases. Now, I know you call those functional false positive cases, but in other words, they their kind of, whatever kind of contact tracing they had was much more surgical and used a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer. But how else can we account for, Japan has something like 17 deaths per million compared to the, the U.S. at 830 and Belgium at over 1,400. It seems to me that with a gap that large, it can't just be government policy. I mean, it seems like there's got to be some pre-existing immunity or something at work here. What's your thinking on that? Yeah, it has, I agree with that. I mean, if you think about uh, the difference between the Japanese versus the Chinese response, I mean, the Chinese came off pretty well, right, with this draconian lockdown that they had relatively few deaths compared to the size of the population and, the, and how old they are. Japan, very, very old, and it also came off well. It's, there seems like to be some policy invariance in, in, the, in, the, in East Asia over this. No matter what policy you pick, you get a, you get a good result. And as you say, the, the Japanese policy has been relatively lax. There really hasn't been a, a sharp lockdown. Uh, there was a, a seroprevalence study, I think, at, uh, in Kobe in, in April or May sometime. They found hundreds of infections to each identified case. You know, they, they were not looking for the virus. They were looking for people who were sick with the virus. And uh, they didn't have that many. For now, of course, they're seeing, I think, some more, more cases now, but it's still the same kind of, same kind of thing. It's like uh, what we're seeing is relatively mild infections in, the, in, the East, in East Asia. I think the only explanation must be something like pre-existing immunity, although the, the definitive studies are not done yet on that to prove that, but that seems to me the leading hypothesis. Okay, because it just seems to make the most sense of... Of, of the data. Now, let's see, likewise, I live in Florida, which is completely open in the sense that there are no state mandated occupancy restrictions or anything like that. The localities can still impose mask mandates, but they just can't collect fines on the mandates. And, and incidentally, I see people wearing masks everywhere in Florida, absolutely everywhere. So the, it, there may as well be a mask mandate. But other than that, for the most part, life is essentially normal. I mean, I've, I've gone to see a play there are concerts resuming at the King Center in Melbourne. I mean, little by little things. You're making me jealous, Tom. Yeah, I know. I'm so sorry to tell you this. <laughs> I know. Normal life is resuming here. But what's interesting about this is just today I saw a chart generated by a fellow named Ian Miller who generates a lot of charts on, on Twitter. And he's plotting hospitalizations per million in California versus Florida. And starting at September 25th when Florida officially opened, the very day after the roundtable with you, which was interesting, and you see that the, the, the lines in California and Florida track each other pretty closely over the ensuing month and a half, to, or I guess two months now, except California is now somewhat higher than Florida. And it just seems like back in March when I was at first very alarmed by this, and I believed all the stuff about exponential growth and then this many will have it and then this many and there'll be this many dead and so on and on. How is it possible that Florida can be this open and its hospitalization results are better than California's, even though Florida has the fifth oldest population and California has the 44th oldest? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of policy invariance there, right? I mean, like the, and the, actually the key to the, the policy invariance idea is, if, okay, so if you want to understand why two places that are similar in population, like California and Florida in some sense, except older in Florida, why they might have the same result. You have, to, you have to really understand how effectively did policy protect the old. That's the number one contributor to death if you want to compare places like uh, California and Florida. Actually, the same, same thing with Africa. Like, why, did they, why is Africa done so well? I mean, there's a very small fraction of that population is over 65. Yeah. I mean, that's the first order thing you need to think about. I think Florida did a, a much better job in, in some ways than uh, much of the rest of the country in protecting its older population. And so once you've done that, it doesn't matter what you do to the rest of the, rest of the population, as long as you've secured the people who are actually likely to be hospitalized and die from, it, uh, from infection. Then the rest of the population, for the most part, some, some of them will get sick, but for the most part, people get infected and won't get very sick. And uh, they won't produce many hospitalizations. They won't produce much, much death. 
I think that's really the key thing. And on the other side, the lockdowns, California locked down our state. My kids, uh, I think my, my, my younger son just got to go to school for one day this week, and they're likely to end that, uh, like in person. The, the, my kids still can't go to school, I really. It'll be a whole year and some before they get to go to school. It will have caused this enormous harm to a vast number of people for almost no gain, I think, at the end of the day on the, the, how the epidemic wore out. Hey, everybody, let's take a quick break to thank our sponsor, BetterHelp. I want to be open and transparent with you and tell you this is a service I myself have used. And in fact, long before I ever thought they'd be a sponsor of The Tom Woods Show. From the comfort of your home, BetterHelp offers you licensed professional counselors who are specialized in dealing with depression, anger, stress, anxiety, family conflicts, sleeping, trauma, and a whole lot more. We can all use some help from time to time. And with BetterHelp, You can connect in a safe and private online environment. You can start communicating in under 24 hours. This is not self-help. It's professional counseling. You can send a message to your counselor anytime. You get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule video or phone sessions. And they match you with the perfect person for your situation. I just needed a neutral third party to help me talk through some issues I was thinking about. And BetterHelp matched me with the perfect person for me. Anything you share is confidential, of course. And in fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp, they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Well, I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash woods. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash woods. Now, of course, you are one of the drafters of the Great Barrington Declaration. My listeners are quite familiar with that. Uh, GBDeclaration.org is where you should go. You should read it and sign it. And of course, we know that the message of that is that the public health implications of lockdowns results have just been catastrophic, and we have to proceed in a different way. And that involves focused protection of people who are especially vulnerable. Now, the, the, the primary response you've gotten – let's forget about the invective and the name-calling and all that, but let's in terms of scholarly response. Generally, what I've seen has not been – that that's not correct or something. It's more that it's not feasible. That may, that, so they're kind of Im- implying that if we could come up with a way to make your plan feasible, where we really could sort of isolate people who are at risk, then maybe it would make sense. But that in, as a practical matter, so the theory I think they accept, but as a practical matter, they say it just can't be done. And you've been trying to say that, well, that's because you haven't thought it through quite enough. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I think um, we've, we've been intellectually lazy, right? We thought that if we want to protect the vulnerable, the only way to do it is by, is by lockdown. So that by slowing community spread, we then thereby automatically protect the vulnerable. But you can see that's failed, right? The, the lockdown doesn't actually end up isolating the vulnerable. A community spread eventually happens and it, and it hits the vulnerable. And we haven't even tried to protect the vulnerable in many groups, right? So the lockdowns, for instance, create intergenerational homes, right? They make young people lose their job, go live with older parents. We send university students back home to live with their parents, thus creating a risk for the older parents that they would, that otherwise wouldn't have had. The lockdowns expose poor working class people because they're deemed essential, even if they're vulnerable to the virus. The lockdowns don't make any distinction based on risks. They just, it's this blunderbuss idea and, and it's blocked critical thinking. That from a community of people that are normally quite creative about protecting people. There are lots of ideas potentially you can use. Actually, can we circle back to the vaccine? Sure. Because the vaccine is a, is a fantastic tool for, for focus protection, if you think about it, right? So the, the big constraint with the vaccine is going to be the, getting the sufficient doses. Well, you know, in, in, within um, two months, we'll have enough doses to cover the, if, you know, assuming the data, the safety data come out the way I anticipated and the um, efficacy data come out the way I anticipate. We'll have enough of safe and effective vaccines to cover every single vulnerable person in the American population, right? Uh, older, older people, hospital workers, people, uh, uh, maybe in some, some folks with chronic diseases. I mean, I think we, 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 and anyone who wants the dose can get it that in that vulnerable group. At that point, we have perfect focus protection. The debate that's going on right now is people that are saying, you said four months. Actually, it's not going to be four months before everyone gets the vaccine. It'll be, it'll be a year before there's sufficient doses of the vaccine for everybody, really. You know, again, assuming the, I mean, I, I, we've, had, we've made some miracles of production, uh, bef- you know, of science and production before, so I suppose that's still possible. But, I mean, that's the, I mean, a, a current, like a timeline of a year is not unreasonable. 
do we, do we wait a year before we open up while we wait until everyone gets vaccinated? Or do we just, we vaccinate the older people and some other high risk folks and then open up? That's, that's the debate, I think, that's currently, that, that, that at least I'd like to see. Because it's, to me, the, the vaccine is a perfect vehicle, at least potentially for focus protection. Do you have any safety concerns about the vaccine? Either, any of them so far? I mean, obviously, it's maybe it's too early to say, but are you at all concerned about that? I am concerned. I mean, I haven't seen any of the data yet. They haven't yet released the data. I think December 8th is the uh, is when the FDA is planning to release the data in, in a, a publicly release in anticipation for the uh, the meeting on the 10th. So um, I'm looking forward to that. I know that the um, in the UK, they just approved their vaccine. I think the Moderna one, right? Um, if I'm not mistaken. So that means that, uh, that, that, but I haven't seen the data out of that yet, yet either. I mean, we should be concerned. It's not just, it's what I'm going to be looking for is not just uh, the safety data on, on, in aggregate, but by age. Because I really, what I really care about for this vaccine is the older population. It's most useful for the old, like take, like take my kids, right? So if I have a, I have a 13 year old, if, if, he, if he gets COVID, his likelihood of a bad outcome is vanishingly small. Frankly, the vaccine, unless it's like, perfectly safe for children is going to be worse than COVID. So what you want to do is look for age-specific adverse event rates and age-specific efficacy rates, and, and then make sure that, that, that those match the policy. I mean, I think the right policy is protect the old. So you would put up with a slightly higher serious adverse event rate for, for the vaccine among the old because COVID is so much worse uh, for the old, 95% survival. So I think, I think that's, those are the data I'm going to be looking for once, once they start publicly releasing them. I think I'm going to ask you to put on a hat that you may not even own, and that is uh, the hat of a political analyst. And that's not what you do for a living, but on the other hand, you've observed how the political class has handled this matter since March, and maybe it's given you some insight. Presuming, well, here's what I've seen so far. Joe Biden says he's going to ask Americans to wear masks for 100 days, which, you know, masks are another matter. It seems like Americans have been wearing them for well over 100 days by now, fairly high compliance. But okay, he wants to do that. And he may have this or that other thing he wants to do. But there have been two schools of thought on what's likely to happen under a President Biden. One is that uh, you hear all these pessimistic people say they're never going to give up their powers that they have. That we're never going back to normal. And I actually don't buy that. I understand why people think that would be the case. I actually find that wildly implausible. I, I think that it, there is a path for Biden out of the corner that they've painted themselves into. The vaccine will help. They could deal with the PCR testing and lower the cycle thresholds, and that would lower the number of cases that are discovered. It seems like there are ways that he could do a few token things at the beginning and then declare victory. Do you think that's just wishful thinking? No, I think I don't think that's wishful thinking. I mean, I think the, the uh, so we've been talking about one story of this epidemic, right? The story that, that, that we've been told we've been told is about uh, a very widespread disease that affects the elderly more than the non-vulnerable people, and uh, that the with an IFR an infection fatality rate that's very very low for under under sixty five, where lockdowns don't have an enormous effect as far as like slow, actually. Uh, suppressing the disease for a very long time. Instead, you just delays cases. I mean, that's one theory of the disease. Another theory that this is the mainstream theory, and everyone's familiar with it, is the disease is our fault. We fail to abide by the lockdowns. We fail to abide by the mask mandates. When it spreads, it's our fault. And if we if we just abided by these these strictures that we that are put in front of us and and just grit our teeth and bear it, we could we could uh, we could get out of this mess. Right. So, you know, like it's of a piece, like to ask Americans to wear masks for 100 days. Well, you know, 90 percent of Americans are already wearing masks. What what uh, what what's different? That, that, so, so it's a token, right, to say it's 100 days of mask wearing, then, then declare victory. It would vindicate the mainstream theory. It would say, look, uh, we got out of it because Americans wore masks for 100 days. I mean, I think there's some element of, you know, because I've been trying to understand why so many people look at the data. I mean, you know, smart people look at the data that I'm looking at and have such a different reaction to it. I, they must see what I'm seeing. I mean, in the early days of the epidemic, it's completely reasonable to have a different opinion. I mean, we did, didn't have very much information. But now, to look at the data and think somehow that this, this narrative about lockdowns and masks as the, mace, the, the reason why we're in the situation we're in and it protecting us, I don't see how that's tenable. But uh, these are very smart people and they want to have some story 
where they didn't make an enormous mistake. I think, the, I think personally, probably the single biggest public health mistake in a century. So I think, I mean, you know, no one wants to think they were that wrong. But I, so I think that there's going to be a lot of demand for some kind of fig leaf. Yeah, that's exactly it, a fig leaf, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's a political thing. It's, I always think of that as a psychological. I mean, I could be wrong. I, I don't know. but Because, you know, I, I tend not to have that much insight into, into how people... Uh, I mean, I, I, I would think that people, when they see data that contradicts their worldview, they might start to question the worldview. And here, I, I've, I've been wrong on that a bunch of times during this epidemic. And I was wrong thinking that by now, far more people would be demanding an end to this policy. And if anything, half the country has dug in its heels even further regardless. The thing is, I can go on social media and I can be armed with all the data and charts in the world. But then the other side, which would, I'm just talking about ordinary people, not experts, will just come back at me with the number 250,000 deaths. So I've got all the nuance and everything in the world and they just say 250,000 deaths and that's because Trump didn't do X, Y, or Z. And they just think that one number trumps, so to speak, everything. What do you do in that situation? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, it's obviously the 250,000 deaths unfortunate. I mean, I, I view those 250,000 deaths, many of them are as a result of policy, policy failure, right? Why are 40% of American COVID deaths in nursing homes? That we knew at the beginning of the epidemic was where the, the you know, in the very first days of the epidemic, we, we heard that nursing home in Washington state was, uh, was sick, right? And had a lot of, uh, a lot of sickness there and death. We should have known from the beginning that that was the place where we need to protect people. Instead, we thought we immediately came to the conclusion, I think looking at Wuhan and at uh, Bergamo, that uh, the constraint was ventilators and the constraint was hospital beds. And in order to meet that constraint, we, uh, we sent patients, positive pa- COVID patients, infectious COVID patients back to nursing homes that couldn't manage to isolate them, infecting and killing, I mean, I don't know how many people. We've gotten better at that through the epidemic. And I said, I think Florida has done, done a much better job um, than, than some of the other states. Um, but it's, it's one of these things where like that is, that's a very clear evidence of a policy failure almost from the beginning of the epidemic. 250,000, there could have been much less if we had, if we had learned of how to, uh, from, from the data about how to deal with the epidemic. You're at Stanford and Scott Atlas was at Stanford. I, I suppose you know him personally? I do. I, I got to know him actually through the epidemic. I, I knew him a little before, but not. But we got to we come to be pretty good friends since. What's your response? I mean, I, I don't want to get you in trouble with your colleagues. It's probably too late. I, now. I'm already in trouble with my colleagues. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your reaction to how he was treated, not only by his colleagues but by, well, frankly, almost everybody? It's it's disgraceful. I mean, I, let me just speak for my colleagues. I think um, I speak about my colleagues. I think there are two actions that I very strongly disagree with my colleagues over. You know, so first, he's a, he's, a, he's a special advisor to the president. That is a very difficult job, right? You have to, you have to try to stay up with the science. He's a si- special science advisor to the president. You have to stay up with science as best you can. He has a particular point of view. It's also, it's a, obviously a political job. So he's in the media's eye. He's in the, he's in the um, so it's, it's, and so there's communication both with the media and with the president and with the scientific community. So understanding that that's the case, how do you on the outside, now it's, it's a public, Thing. So like, so, you know, if you're on the outside, you don't agree with him about, or you think that he doesn't know something that he ought to know, and you're a colleague of his, how do you manage that? I mean, look, what I, what I would do is I would write to him and say, look, uh, Scott, here's, you, you said this, and here's what I think is right, and here's why I think it's true. And then, you know, we can have a conversation or not. I mean, it's up to him. It's obviously, he's, it's his job. I might get unhappy if he doesn't listen to me, but like I've, I've, done, I've done my duty as a citizen and as a scientist for trying to inform the person that's informing the president. Instead, they wrote a letter where they cited a whole bunch of things that they thought he believed. So I think simply because the media, I mean, like they, said, they said he doesn't believe in hand washing. That is just a lie, right? That he does, he, it is very clear he believes in hand washing. Right? So, I mean, he's never said, I mean, I can tell you, he's t- <laughs> He personally, he know, he's told me, because I asked him about the letter, he said, this is ridiculous. So why would you write such a letter other than just to publicly embarrass him and undermine his, his ability to, to advise the president wisely, right? Instead of just giving him, you know, sort of advice quietly or even publicly saying, here's, the, here's what's the right thing. Instead of saying, here's what, what I think you said, here's what's, what's right, uh, here's, the, here, here's what's actually the truth, they, they painted a picture of what he, what he believed 
with, with a set of statements where, that don't correspond to what he actually believes. And, and it's just ex- essentially tried to score, uh, like, you know, sort of say that he's not following the science. I mean, that was just, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't understand. And there are a bunch of, the folks who signed it are a bunch of our friends of mine. I think they went way out of, I think they were out of line. They, sh- they shouldn't have done that. But I think that was, I think that was the first mistake. And it actually chilled conversation at Stanford. I've, I've managed I to, that, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've had very few opportunities at Stanford to talk with my, even my friends about my views who don't agree with me, whereas normally they <laughs> we get to have very vigorous discussions. Whereas, like I've been, I managed to talk with people all over the, the country and the world. That, that uh, as you saw, like some debates with people at Harvard, uh, conversations with people, you know, just a whole bunch of other places where the open conversations still can happen. Although, although science has not been good at that generally, but Stanford has been particularly bad. And then the faculty senate voted to, to basically excommunicate him from from Stanford. Right, they use the word anathema, which is a like a you know religious term for yeah. excommunication. In effect, uh, saying that he's not even a respected member of the community. This is a this is a man who's worked very hard to convey a scientific view, I think a defensible one, to the president of the United States. The president had the other view. Uh, he had this task force that included Fauci and Burks and all these other things. Not like he didn't have the other view, right? So Scott is completing the picture. In his giving in giving his advice to the president, and they're saying because he did that, he's not even a responsible scholar, not a responsible enough scholar to belong in the Stanford community anymore. I think that that is, I don't have words to describe it. I mean, I just I, I'm, I'm so disgusted with it. Uh, I think it's frozen academic. It's it's made a mockery of academic freedom at Stanford. Yeah, I've I've long wished. Uh, you know, I'm I'm too small potatoes, but I I would love to be able to have it chance to talk to him because I think what he did was heroic. And I think the way he handled the media is just how they need to be handled. Uh, because normally people saying things that are not on the three by five card of allowable opinion, they back down when they're confronted by the media. But to the contrary, like a teacher, he sat there and said, listen, this is I'm telling you what the science is. This is the science. <laughs> You're going to sit there and listen. And that's about time to see one of the, the good guys doing that. Let me ask you one other thing and then I'll, I'll let you go. I asked uh, Martin Koldorf about Dr. Fauci, and and he's you know Professor Koldorf is a is a is a great guy, and he has a temperament very much like yours, and he v- answered that question very diplomatically. He said, "Dr. Fauci is a very respected immunologist, and if you had a question I- involving that field, uh, he would be a good person to ask." But he says there are a lot of other scientific questions that an immunologist wouldn't know the answer to. <laughs> so so the implication there was that we've taken this one person and superstitiously attributed to him magical powers to the point where it, there's this presumption that somehow Dr. Fauci, when he was in, in graduate school, took a course teaching him, if you lock people in their homes, now there could be a lot more cancer deaths than you would have had otherwise. So here how, here's how you balance that. Of course, he took no such course. There is no such course. But people seem to think that if he recommends something, that's what the science says. And then moreover, we had this confrontation between him and Rand Paul. Rand Paul was trying to say, I think that immunity could go beyond just antibodies. And Fauci just practically lost his, blew his top over that. But increasingly, that does seem to be correct. What is your assessment of this? Do you feel like you can just give a raw assessment of this man? I mean, you know, I have on my shop bookshelf uh, a textbook from which I, you know, uh, the Harrison's Internal Medicine. Where he was an editor. Right? He is. He is a. Uh, I've long respected him and, and uh, in his in his knowledge, but I think during this epidemic he has failed. Uh, he's just. It's. Uh, I, th- I think he has not kept up with the science. Like that that example of that interchange with Rand Paul is instructive because the T cell evidence was available then. He's failed on schools. The evidence about school about children not not spreading the disease, you know, that came that became available in March. It was, I mean, uh, you know, like it, it, like the, that, that Iceland study about uh, that contact tracing study in Iceland where they they did the mutation analysis that came out in I think April. We, we knew very early in the epidemic that children are not the center of central, but yet Dr. Fauci spread fear about that over sort of equivocal scientific results. I mean, I think that so, and as a result, school children around the country have, have, have lost, you know, year, I mean, lost their right to schooling essentially, especially poor kids. Um, he's and on the Great Barrington Declaration, he he mischaracterized it, I think, knowingly 
are saying that we believe that we should let the disease spread rampantly, and we don't. Right? We want to protect the vulnerable. We want to protect the old. That's central to the Great Parenting Declaration idea. Just simply so he didn't have to discuss it with us. I think. I mean, I, if I'm if I'm trying to be uh, if I'm trying to be charitable, so I think it's iris. What he's he's behaved in ways that are detached from science and 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 in many ways irresponsible. Uh, and I think the the harm from the, his leadership during this epidemic, uh, we're going to be counting those harms for a very long time. And yet, what will not surprise me, would not at all surprise me if he, he gets a book contract and or, frankly, a movie. There'll be a movie, absolute propaganda from beginning to end. I can already script what's going to happen. The, the wise people in white coats were trying to tell us what to do, but the stupid rubes with their backward baseball caps just wouldn't stay home and had to go to their motorcycle rally. I, I can script the whole thing. It'll be written for people with an IQ of 70. Like, we already know this, this is going to be the outcome. So we need independent filmmakers and documentary makers to chronicle the reality of what's happening before we let that happen. Tom, you're the historian. You get to, you get to write the last draft, right? I mean, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I, I, I think, um, I, I mean, I, at this point, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm just thinking about how to get us out of this this mess, I mean, this policy mess that we're in, I, I just yeah. like figure, I mean, I, I don't know what the historians will write. At, and I, you know, to some extent, it's not my business really. I, I just, I think, I think we have to like, uh, what I'm really concerned about is the next time we have an epidemic like this, that we never knee jerk jump into the kind of policy responses we've done. Uh, so I, what I would like to see is a, is a, a evaluation of this and a revision of our plans. I mean, for instance, I, I would like to see, the First Amendment come live again in the United States because I, I, it feels to me like it's dead. I mean, I think things like that we have to revisit squarely. If, if the historical revision, if the historical sto- storytelling involves that involved helps us get to that point, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll participate as best I can. The key thing is we can't let this happen again. Yeah, that's exactly why. Even if they find some fig leaf and the thing we more or less get back to normal. I don't want to be stuck in my house every five years and have people's businesses be destroyed every five years. Then they'll just quit starting them. I can't imagine how we can run a society like this. So it's very important. So I was just saying the other day, it's it's not like because the Great Depression was a long time ago, it doesn't matter whether or not we understand what caused it. Yeah. Because people will use the Great Depression or the New Deal, rightly or wrongly, as defenses for what they're doing in the present. So we've got to get this right. It's very, very important. What action step would you want to leave my audience with today? What can they do? Well, I think start, start to speak up. Like at the school board meetings, say what you know, because otherwise what you, what you get is just fear. Uh, the other thing I think, and this, I, I was trying to think about like why uh, so many people have gone along with this. I mean, I think one is the fear. I think that, that's very clear, right? And in fact, the fear is itself a policy outcome of this epidemic. People have intentionally driven people to fear for, for reasons that, that violate, for, 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 I mean, which is a violation of every public health principle I've ever learned about. So I think start addressing people's fear is very important with like data about what the, what the survival rate actually is, which is you know incredibly high for people under 70. And then the, the other thing is there's this action bias that leads people, you know, people I think in general have this like good conscience where they want to do good and uh, the folks on the on the lockdown side have used that to say, well, if you wear a mask, you're good, you can do good for others, or you do you just comply with the lockdown, you're doing good for others. Stay at home, you're doing good for others. We have to replace that with act- active steps that people can take that actually would do good for others. So things like you know if you're if you're if you have neighbors that are older, offer to like deliver groceries to them, right? Uh, if if you if you if you had COVID and, you, and thus you're probably most likely almost certainly immune, offer to go to nursing homes where there are lots of older people that are isolated and, and uh, depressed and dying. Um, so just talk to them, right? Uh, I mean, I think there are active steps we can take given where we know the harms are from these lockdowns uh, that people can take. We don't have to wait for government to do that, to, to, to help others in the community. And I think that engages people's conscience in, in a good way. So we, we flip the moral calculus in some sense. The lockdowns are a terrible evil, right? They've They've caused all this damage that I'm sure your listeners know. So, so I won't go into the litany of it. Helping people understand that, but also take steps to help mitigate them. The, those, I think that's really going to be important in the days coming forward. Well, that's an excellent message. I'm going to link at tomwoods.com slash 1792, our show notes page, to the Great Barrington Declaration. People should go there. And I may link to a video or two of yours because I think the more 
of your stuff people consume, the better. And all I can say is thank you because right around the time we first made contact, I think it was just when the Great Barrington Declaration was coming out and you must have had no idea the flood that was about to hit you. So I appreciate you making the time for the Tom Wood Show. My audience is, is going to be very grateful. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. It was an honor. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for our episode for today. Make sure you sign that Great Barrington Declaration as I recommend. Check out tomwoods.com slash 1792 as our show notes page. And tomorrow, I'm going to be talking to our old friend Michael Malice. But this time, we're not going to talk about what's going on in the news or some topic in intellectual history or anything like that. But we're going to talk about something that I think might be interesting, even if you're not ever planning to write a book. And I assume that's 99% of my audience. But if you're interested in books and authors and what the process is, Michael and I are actually going to talk about how to write a book. And so instead of talking about what's in our books, we're going to talk about the actual process of doing it. And there's some interesting material here. And of course, anytime we have Michael on the program, it's always enjoyable and never boring. Let's put it that way. So I hope you'll join me for that. Make sure you subscribe to the show, tomwoods.com slash Apple. And I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.